This show talks about books that feature mental health and mental illness topics. There are many books that include this topic, and my hope is that more and more people know about them because they help to decrease the stigma and help people not feel so alone in their struggle. I am your host, Robin Tamanaha. Joining me on this episode is my guest, Gloria Joy Sherrod, who wrote the book, Adulting with ADHD, Navigating Adult Life with Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. She is a licensed professional counselor who has years of experience providing counseling services to children, adolescents, and adults. In addition to her counseling work, she also provides ADHD coaching services. She is passionate about advocating for equity in education, access to care, and ending mental health stigma. Yay. Hi, Gloria. Hello. Hello. How are you? I am well. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this. Thanks for being here. I read your book. I have your book too, and I love it. So super, super excited. Um, I do have a lot of questions when it comes to ADHD, but first I thought maybe we'll talk a little bit about your book, just like for the listeners and for the viewers, like kind of how it came about and like what readers could expect from it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll I'll try to make a long story short, which is an interesting thing for me as an ADHD -er. Uh, but basically I, uh, was, I had a whole list of mental health topics that I wanted to write about. And I ended up speaking with an author coach and talking about my ideas with them. And they started just talking to me about their child who had ADHD, but they never got any further information after the diagnosis. Um, and that kind of made me reflect on my own experience. And like, I'm also going through this with my daughter at the same time I'm having this conversation. Uh, so I started doing a bunch of research. I ended up doing my master's final project on ADHD, and then I wrote my book kind of during my uh, master's program. Wow. So you were writing it like while you were in the program. That's really neat. Yes. Yes. And while being in school. Oh my goodness. I was done with all my classes. So I was just uh, on my internship and working with a lot of people who had ADHD, who had just discovered it. Um, and so it was really nice to be able to apply the strategies that I was writing about with clients and with myself and to be writing the book at the same time. So it was actually pretty helpful. Yeah. So what could the readers like expect from your book? So I made sure that it was very concise and it just has the point, no fluff. Um, that's very important to me uh, because I know that my audience would appreciate that, as well as uh, having a lot of applicable strategies that you can use. There's a lot of fill in the blanks, activities, and the activities that I put in the book are very unique and creative. I wanted to make it interesting. I didn't want it to be like one of those self-help books that you read and it's just kind of like, you know, the same kind of questions and you're just answering questions. There's doodling involved there's activities that you can do and it's very like do it at your own pace do one thing at a time um, and it's extremely holistic in that it's targeting every area of your life as a person with ADHD including your relationships and communication nutrition um, keeping track of dates and deadlines procrastination and all those things and they all have an activity attached yeah, I love that about your book as well. Like I'm very much like a visual person too and all the visuals in it. And I remember too, like the the doodling, you know, aspect of it too. I thought that was like really cool. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. That was really important to me to have in there to keep the reader engaged. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's dive in, you know, for um, you know, for the listeners and the viewers, like diving into first off is kind of probably the always like the first question, but like kind of what is ADHD? So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. Um, so when we think about neurodevelopmental conditions, um, things like autism, that's also a neurodevelopmental condition. So something that you're born with that happens in development. Um, so the criteria is that you would have had to have symptoms since age 12. And it, there are three different types. There's inattentive type, hyperactive impulsive type, and then there's combined type where you might have a little bit of both of those things. So someone who is inattentive might have difficulties with working memory, which means 
holding on to information in the moment to use it in the next moment. So it's very attached to your attention span more than kind of something you remember from yesterday or even like an hour ago. It's like remembering something that happened five minutes ago is more difficult with someone uh, with ADHD. And even some people with ADHD have extremely uh, good long-term memory in general. Um, and then there's the planning, organizing, task initiation, which is knowing you have to do something but getting started. I would say like all of my clients have the task initiation difficulties, no matter what type they have. And then hyperactive impulsive type has a little bit of that same um, difficulty with organizing and planning and sustained attention, but there's this added piece of kind of chattiness or moving around a lot, the stereotypical view of ADHD really, uh, where the restlessness instead of being internal is on the outside and you have to move, move, move to release some of that energy and then combined is both. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for, thanks for explaining that. Cause I think um, it's important to know like the different, the different types and some may not, you know, and I know with your book, it's, um, you know, part of the title is like adulting, like adults. So, um, which I love because I know there's a lot of like stuff out there when it comes to kiddos, like the young ones, but then, you know, not so much, um, you know, with adults, is there, like a difference in how it would look like in a, in a child versus an adult with ADHD? Yes, and I think it's mainly due to the context um, of what we're doing in our lives as we get older. And even kind of going back to the subtypes, your type can change throughout your life. So you can be a child with hyperactive type and grow up to be someone with inattentive type or, or vice versa. It can change within like six months in your life, you can change from one type to another. Um, and yeah, so the reason that I kind of wanted to make resources for adults is because when I went to go find information for adults, for myself, everything, you Google ADHD and it's all about for parents, for their children. Um, there's very little information for adults. It's starting to grow rapidly now, which is great, but, but it didn't really exist much. So people, adults with ADHD might have trouble keeping up with deadlines at work, um, a, a lot of women are having trouble balancing all of their responsibilities, remembering to schedule doctor's appointments for their children, remembering to be places on time. Um, just all of the things you have to remember as an adult is really hard. And it's funny because I actually just did a survey the other day about parents uh, with ADHD on my platform. And I wanted to know what is the hardest part of being a parent with ADHD? And everyone's kind of like, you know, regulating my emotions and then also modeling that for my children and staying calm when they're not able to stay calm and keeping up with all the deadlines and all the, you know, their homework and the things that their school wants me to do. And then I asked neurotypical people on my other platform, what is the biggest uh, hurdle for you as parents? And it was much like, bigger things like, oh, you know, not wanting to impose my trauma on them or like wanting them to grow up to good, be good people. So it's like people with ADHD are literally trying to get through each day, like the things that people consider small. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up the, um, the emotion regulation piece. Cause I feel like that's not like so much talked about a lot or mentioned, especially when it comes to ADHD, but it does factor in. Is it like, what kind of brings that up is it the stressors is that like a kind of a part of having ADHD as well as like the emotion stuff yeah it's actually a part of the um makeup of the brain that causes the emotional dysregulation and it's kind of interesting because if you look in the diagnostic manual um emotion regulation will not be in there for ADHD because I can't remember exactly what they said why they didn't put it in initially but because it wasn't measurable or something like that but it's actually one of the main things that everyone with ADHD pretty much deals with. Um, it's an executive functioning skill and, and ADHD is an executive functioning um, impairment. So when we think about executive functioning, that's our ability to um, in inhibit our behaviors, control our emotions, plan, organize all those things. And so because ADHD impairs your executive functioning, uh, the emotion regulation difficulties are going to be inherent with that. Yeah, that sounds really challenging, you know, and I wonder, I mean, as adults, adulting, you know, there's so many adulting things to do, all these tasks and responsibilities, you know, I would wonder too, how many um, individuals like 
were later diagnosed, you know, with ADHD, not until later in life because of all these, whether it's the kiddos, you know, being parent, work, balancing and juggling all these things, you know, I would wonder too how many like ended up finding out later in life that they may have it. Yeah. So many. Yeah. And I think when we think about school growing up for people, um, a lot of people have parents who are very hands-on with their education. So they're making sure the things are in the backpack before the child goes to school. And they're very like on top of it. So especially people who had parents who were extremely involved, they did pretty well in school because that organization piece was done by their parents. So usually they'll fall apart when they get to college and now they're on their own with that part or after that point where you're having to make your own schedule and structure your own life, that's when things often start to get a, li a little bit more difficult. And then when we look at emotion regulation difficulties, a lot of the time that's misdiagnosed as something else because the diagnostic manual doesn't mention it. Some professionals don't really know how big that is. So they will think that it's a mood disorder instead of ADHD. Right, right. I know we've touched on, um, you know, what, what it does look like. Are there certain like misconceptions when it comes to ADHD? So many. Um, I think the main thing is that people think you have to be hyper. Uh, they think that everyone is hyperactive impulsive type, which is not the case. Some people who are inattentive, like appear to be very calm, collected people. Um, even though they might still be having a million thoughts a second and the restlessness on the inside, they still are pretty calm. Um, and thinking about just the overall view of adults having ADHD, the misconception is that, oh, like you have it as a child and then you grow out of it and you don't have it anymore as an adult. And most of the time, if it's true ADHD, if the diagnosis was accurate, it will follow someone into adulthood. And the only time it gets easier is if perhaps you get a career that's really great for your ADHD and then you don't really have to worry about it too much. Are there certain careers that are like a good fit? Oh yeah. Um, so when we think about what motivates the ADHD brain, it's urgency, novelty, uh, interest-based things. So the things that you're passionate about that you love. So if you go into something that you really love, if you're studying something you're really interested in, it's not a chore to like read the book about it. Like that was kind of my experience is that I love reading about psychology. I could read about it all day in my free time. So even if I wasn't reading the textbook I was supposed to read, I knew everything about it because I was studying it all the time because I loved it. Um, and then in, so urgency, a lot of people that I work with are like nurses. So it's that, you don't have time to procrastinate in when you're saving lives. Um, and the brain kind of thrives off of that go, go, go energy where someone who's neurotypical might be a little bit more stressed out by that experience. For ADHD, it's like, this is my element that I'm having to chase, you know, these situations all day. That's so interesting. And I think that's very um, hopeful, you know, as well because just, you know, sometimes diagnoses in general, so it's like kind of this like huge label. And some people think like, what comes with this? Can, can I be successful? Can I do the things I want to do? And it sounds like from what you're saying, like you very much can. And also in these really amazing fields too, like the medical field, that's huge, especially right now. Mm -hmm. So important. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. There are so many things. There's so many strengths that come with ADHD that if we focus on developing those, that makes a huge difference. I think that one of the biggest things I've learned from anyone who I've talked to who's successful in general is that when you spend time developing your strength versus trying to grow your weakness, you go so much further, especially when your weakness is something that when you get successful, you could pay someone else to do it. You don't have to be good at cleaning your house or like, you know, that stuff, that stuff that anyone could do for you. But if you're developing your strength in your career and everything else, you, you can do just fine. Yeah. What are some other like, like some positives of having like ADHD? Um, so I think it depends on the person and the type, but one of the things is, so in addition to these other jobs, people with ADHD are more likely to become entrepreneurs because we have so many ideas. So my literally, I have to slow myself down. This sometimes gets in the way because I'm like five ideas a day that I'm like, I really want to do these. And then sometimes I can get you off track where 
Uh, undiagnosed ADHD often looks like I have all these ideas and I never finish any of them because I get a new one tomorrow. Uh, but once you kind of get that under control or have some accountability uh, with your ADHD, you can focus on those ideas and grow them. And that's a huge benefit. Um, the energy, I know that when I was a teacher, I was a preschool teacher at one time, just the energy to like keep up with the kids and be creative with them and be, you know, energetic and innovative. Those were all things that really helped me. Um, intuition is strong in most people with ADHD. I actually just did a, another uh, poll on my platform for personality types. So I don't know if you're familiar with Myers-Briggs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I was trying to see if most people had the same personality type amongst ADHDers, and it looked like the pattern for sure was that everyone had intuitiveness as one of their, their strengths. So that's, that's common because the brain is not filtering out details. So you're seeing everything. So you're connecting everything too, because your brain is going so fast that you're seeing and connecting things all day. So kind of that scientific brain of, oh, I'm seeing all these things that other people don't see. That's fascinating. That's mm -hmm. really, really cool. Yeah. Yeah. What's um, the, like your social media platforms or what's the yeah so on instagram yeah. um got it oh. yeah yeah i get so much information from people on there it's amazing yeah um is there anything i didn't ask that you feel um uh, whether it's related to adhd or like your book that you would like the listeners or the viewers to know about i also have my documentary also adulting with adhd um, that is on Vimeo on demand and you screen. So, uh, that also kind of gives more background on my story and just talks about what my journey was in depth in terms of my diagnosis and my daughters, and then some other people in there talking about their experiences, what they do for a living and how ADHD has kind of helped them with their strengths and also some of the things that they'd struggle with throughout their lives. So it's a really good educational piece. Yeah. How did that come about? The documentary? Another big idea. <laughs> it was just one of those things where I was like, I would really like to educate people and show them like a non-textbook version of what ADHD looks like. Um, and so I thought, let me interview, you know, a few other people and ask them what their experiences were. So I have um, one woman in there who was the first Black woman to get a PhD in IT, computer science, I'm sorry, from Purdue. Um, she's in there. She talks about her journey and how she thrived with structure growing up because uh, she was in sports. So she was always moving, which is really great for the ADHD brain. So she didn't know till she was an adult that she had ADHD, but she thrived off of that structure that she had growing up. Um, and I have just, there's another woman in there that um, she produces musicals. So she talks about how her ADHD has helped her be able to do that. So it's really interesting to kind of see how it works with everyone and their personality. Yeah, that's really neat. And I think hearing like other people's stories too, like I, I'm a, of course, a huge book lover, you know, and I think I became one later in life just because they're it's important to feel like validated or valued or like seen, you know, and one way is through books and another too is like what you did with the documentary. So that's really, really cool. When did the documentary come out? Um, it was recent. I think Oct October. Yep. October. Oh, wow. Fairly recent. Um, very exciting development. It was one of those things where when I got the idea, I was like, this is crazy. Like, am I really going to make a documentary? Um, so I got some excellent um, people to help me out with following through on that. That's my key thing for me is if I have an idea and I want to get it done, I always facilitate other people to help me with the journey. So the book, I had an author coach on top of me the whole time helping me do it. When I made my social media platform, I had a coach, social media coach helping me stay on top of that. Same with the documentary. So it's always been nice to have that kind of support from people to help me get those things done. Yeah. Was that, or even have you seen like with others, you know, who are living with ADHD, is that kind of one of the, um, 
not so much hurdles, but like one of the things to really kind of bring in is like having some support, even like as an adult, you know, like having some support from others to kind of help with the, with the completion of things. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because one of my biggest uh, difficulties is planning and organizing. Um, and so I just have other people do it with me and for me. Uh, and not that I can never organize anything ever, but um, having an author coach, for example, helping me know, like, where do you start with writing a book? And I think anyone could need that, especially if you've never written a book before. But having me just take my time and do one thing at a time, we often get overwhelmed with thinking of all the steps. So then we just don't start. So her just saying, okay, this week, you're going to just write the whole book. Don't think about all the little details and those little things that trip us up. And me just going through the flow with that. And that's kind of the principle of my coaching that I do is helping people stay accountable to the things that they need to do. That's huge. So they have goals when they come to me that they want to accomplish. And it might be something really big is a huge project. Or it might be, I really just want to keep my house clean or organize a little bit better. And so we'll make goals, we'll make action plans. And every week I'll meet with them and say, you know, what have you done? What's working? What's not working? You know, how can we make this happen for you? And that's usually really helpful for people. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. It sounds very collaborative and also kind of breaking it down into like bite-sized pieces too. Mm -hmm. It really yeah. fills in the blanks uh, where... I think therapy is great for kind of changing your thoughts and your attitudes about things and kind of working through some of the trauma that might come from, you know, growing up with undiagnosed ADHD, feeling inadequate and all those things. Coaching really fills in that blank of, I just don't know how to do day-to-day -day life effectively in those areas. And a coach really comes in and, and fills in that blank. Yeah, yeah, that's wonderful. Out of curiosity, since the, since the publication of your book, or um, I know you're, you're really big on social media as well. So this question could also be for that. Have you received any like really heartwarming or shocking or surprising or like interesting, like fan mail DM or messages from people either related to like your book or like the content that you put out on like your platforms? Yes, every day. It's like wild. I am still like wrapping my head around the impact that it has had uh, because it was one of those things where I was so nervous the day the book came out. Like, what if people hate this? Like, what if it's terrible? And no, I've, I have not received any of that feedback, of course. Um, but yeah, people just saying that it's changed their lives to understand how their brain works. And I think that professionals often, you know, who just don't have the experience of living with it, underestimate the huge impact of just knowing how their brain works. Because when you're neurotypical, you grow up and you kind of know generally like the world is operating in the way that you operate. So naturally you pick up on it and you go. Um, and with ADHD, a lot of the way society is working is working against how you naturally function. So you might inherently think I'm flawed and something's wrong with me that this isn't working for me. So having the content that I put out often helps people understand like, oh, like I can work around this and um, this doesn't mean that I'm doomed or I'm a failure, but I can, I can make things happen. Yeah, that's great. You know, I think that's, that's powerful, you know, that someone and many, it sounds like have been able to you know, use your book and help them moving forward and maybe even like kind of rethinking about themselves because you're right. Like the way, you know, things are set up, you know, I, first thing that comes to mind is sometimes like the education system, you know, too, and like hurdles with that, you know, just how it, it doesn't like fit a lot of things. I, I feel like, so that has to be like such a struggle. Absolutely. Yeah. It's funny because sometimes people come to me with certain goals and then mid coaching after they've learned so much about their brains they're like I'm realizing I don't even need to do that anymore like I like the way my brain works and I can work with that I don't need to like learn how to be like someone else I can be like me and still be successful uh, for example someone asked me just the other day how do I and I get this all the time actually how do I increase my attention span what things can I do to increase my attention span I get that all the time I'm like 
you don't have an attention span deficit. That's not what ADHD is. It's a dysregulation in your attention span, meaning there are things you can focus on and there are things that you can't. And sometimes you can't choose uh, what you're focusing on in a day, but there's ways that you can work around that and harness the times that you do have focus and uh, focus on the things that your brain wants to focus on. Um, we have an interest brain, uh, an interest-based nervous system, meaning, you know, the things that are novel, the things that you're passionate about, you can focus on that all day. So you don't have to learn how to focus. You know how to do that. It's what are we focusing on? That's really interesting. Yeah. I've heard that so many times too, which is interesting that you brought up that question. I feel like that is a common question. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And mindfulness, very helpful. Um, and it's funny too, people come to me, I have this in my book as well, um, and ask, you know, what things, what exercises can I do? So there are exercises you can do to help you learn how to focus on one thing at a time. That's something that we struggle with. We're usually focusing on three things at a time at all times. Um, and mindfulness, what it does is it helps you stay in the present moment and focus on the moment, just not what happened yesterday, not what's happening tomorrow, but what's happening in this moment. And that can be difficult. So I always give very ADHD friendly mindfulness tips, like mindful eating, for example, which is in my book, is just like focusing on eating. Don't be on your phone. Don't be planning your day. Don't be thinking about anything else. And kind of going through a list of things that you're thinking about while you're eating, the texture, the flavor, the temperature, where you are right now. And so you're really training your brain to be right here and nowhere else. Yeah. And that sounds very applicable and, and doable. And it's not clearing your mind. Cause I feel like mindfulness, yes. <laughs> mindfulness is like, there's a lot of like misconceptions with that. And I've been told like, how do I clear my mind? I'm like, that's not, that's not quite mindfulness. You know, mindfulness is what you've mentioned, you know, present moment and focusing on one thing at a time, like the right, right now and everything that you're experiencing with that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah. It's funny. A a people, they see are like, there's no way I'm meditating when they hear that or like, oh, there's no way I'm going to be mindful. And I'm like, trust me, you can do it. And especially with the ways that I, the methods that I have, you could do it in your day-to-day -day life. You don't even have to set aside time. You could do it with the things that you do already eating. Everyone does that at least once a day. So um, kind of implementing it into your day-to-day -day life is something that I always recommend. Um, and knowing that, yeah, you don't have to clear your mind. You just have to right. be here right now. Yeah. So where can people find your book? So it's on Amazon. Um, you can go on my website, GloriaJoyShira.com. Um, and there's a link to the Amazon. It's also on iTunes, Audible and Kindle. Oh, cool. Nice, nice, nice. And I know we touched on some of the platforms. Could you go through like your social media um, handles just for everyone? Yes. So I'm on Facebook. Um, it's just Gloria Joy Sherrod. And then also Instagram, which is X adulting with ADHD X. Cool. So what I'll do is um, I'll put that and the link to your website as well in the show notes and then on the, uh, the description on the YouTube channel. So everyone can just like click on it easily. Yeah. That's good. Awesome. Yay. Well, thanks for being here. And I hope everyone goes out and reads your book, gets it, listens to it, and then also um, follows you on social media. I follow your Instagram as well. And it's like, you put out a lot of really good stuff. I really like it and like videos and stuff too, which is pretty cool. Thank you. Yes. I get a lot of good feedback about the social media. So if you have ADHD, it's a great thing to follow to learn um, in addition to the book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. Thanks for doing this. Um, it was great having you on. And like I said, I absolutely love your book. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.